Thanks everybody for showing up. Hey, look at all these shoes I have here on the, the projector. All of those shoes come off of the Cornell wall. There's about 400 of them. I actually had the opportunity to live with Lee Lyles in Oklahoma for about a year, going through his museum, and he had 56 boards of shoes. There. One thing we don't realize as hoof care providers is how much influence we have on the entire animal. But it's hard to realize that, especially when you start out. You remember the days when your knees were shaking and you were hoping you wouldn't fall down before you got that foot trim. Not to mention putting four shoes on or something like that. It takes a long time to learn that. It takes a long time for your body and your mind to start working together. Modern brain research says it takes about 10,000 hours of repetitive actions to get good at one thing. 10,000 hours. It's 50 to 60 hours a week for four years. Well, that's nothing new, is it? The average apprenticeship is four years. A person started at 12 years old, and they went four years, and by the time they got done, they were a journeyman if they passed the examinations they needed to pass, and then they went on to further their career. It's 10,000 hours of repetitive actions to get good at things. But those 10,000 hours is a barrier. You're just basically learning how to trim a foot. Hopefully you can get it flat. Hopefully you can shape the shoe to put on that, right? 10,000 hours to get there. But then you have to move on. The issue is that it's such a physically demanding job. What you do is tough. It's painful. It's dangerous. It's dirty. There's not too many people that want to do what you're doing. But I'm proud of you for doing that. It's a beautiful example of a combination of art and science put together. 10,000 hours just to get a foot flat. And then you have to go on from there. It's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. It's what you see because it's such a beautiful combination of art and science. It's what you see. And we learn differently as barriers or hoof care providers. It's not necessarily through textbooks. It's through feel, cognitive learning, what your hands and your brain is communicating. And in time, we can feel what needs to be right because you've looked at so many horses you know what needs to be done you can feel it you feel what that horse needs to keep going because your body knows that in the past a thousand horses you've worked on beforehand needed something like that in that environment and things like that so it becomes difficult to verbalize that right we have a hard time verbalizing what we feel is that okay? That's where teaching comes in. If you it's take out an apprentice, uh, the teaching dog. experience is your greatest learning experience. Greatest learning experience because you have to verbalize everything you're seeing and doing. Because even though they might not know too much about it, they have some questions that will put you on the spot. Be faithful in the small things because it is in them that your strength lies. The small things, every little detail, every little detail, every little change you make to your shoe has a significant difference on mostly the coffin joint, but all throughout the animal. Significant difference. And education costs money, but then so does ignorance. Another problem we have is because it's such a physically demanding job, there's a lot of people that start this and don't go on very long, right? You have lots of schools training people to be barriers and by the time they're 30 about 80 percent of them are all done not chewing anymore so they didn't even get the first 10,000 hours in and they're already packing up their bags and leaving because of the difficulties with the position so they, they, they don't have time to go on to the next steps the beauty of uh, this business is well, I don't know how it was for you, but when I started out in the 70s, if two barriers passed each recorded. other on the road, they did the red is just wait. Right? Okay. That was the best. degree of education, <clears throat> <clears throat> communication. <throat> Times have changed. It's so fantastic that we can all get together in a place like this and talk about different things within our occupation, and uh, there's nobody duking it out or uh, having a rough time. So what we're going to talk about today is confirmation. It refers to the physical appearance and outline of a horse as dictated primarily by bone muscle and structures. So here's another 10,000 hours for you, right? After you got that foot flat, after you can get that shoe shaped or made and put on there, now you're going to start talking about confirmation. And all of our textbooks are pretty vague about confirmation. Remember, no, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Without your consent. 
And I just refer to that because you have a tr hard time communicating what's going on with the horse today. I want to help you out with that communication. Confirmation is a sensitive subject and should be handled as such. You know that. Every horse you work on is perfect, right? Just ask the owner. And if you start saying your big words that you've learned, like your horse is carpal valgus betlock varus with an axial rotation, you just diss that horse. You're a bad dude. So be sensitive about that. Every horse has conformational deviations. Every horse has conformational deviations, and I say deviations, not deformations. There's a lot of very crooked horses that can get around a track very fast. They can jump high fences. This doesn't mean the end of them. So what we need to do is look at these conformational deviations and design a routine of evaluating the horse. Because we don't do that very often, do we? When I started out, I felt my job was from the hairline down, nothing else. Right, that was my job. I worked with insensitive tissues. And one day I was embarrassed into looking into it a little closer. Uh, equine practitioner and I were standing against a paddock looking at some horses, quietly looking at these horses. And I'm thinking, well, I might have put a bigger shoe on that one, and I might have fit that one a little more full. And as we turned around and walked away, he says, did you see that bone spavin? Did you see the evidence of that ring bone in that horse? I said, no, I didn't see any of that. He said, how can you be a barrier if you're not looking at that? And I said, my job is from the hairline down. He says, no, partner, you better be looking at the whole horse because you have a, a great effect on the whole horse, the entire animal. So design a program. And we get so busy, right? When I first started out, I wanted to do the big stables, 40, 50 horses at a time, get through those horses, get the numbers done, because that was the inherent behavior of the barriers of the dead. And so I didn't look at the horse. Somebody could ask me late in the evening, what color was the first horse you worked on? I don't know. But it took an odd shoe. Oh yeah, it was a bay, because I was doing thoroughbreds today. They were all bays. <laughs> so get the... Uh, Look at the horses, look at the horses. And I was uh, flying back and forth to West Palm Beach before Wellington was built, showing a bunch of Clydesdales there. I had 25 Clydesdales I showed. They were uh, advertising for the, yeah, the swamp they were gonna turn into Wellington. <laughs> and so I go down there and the famous Seamus and, and uh, the others were there and I'd listen to them at breakfast time in mom's corner kitchen and then when I got done with my four or five Clyde sales that day, I'd go over and just watch him. And Seamus watched every horse before he worked on him. After he got done, he watched him. He'd go and watch him exercise in the morning. He'd go and watch him at the competitions. I said, Seamus, how, how do you spend all that time doing that? He just quietly said, I'm compensated for it. And he was. He charged a lot of money. But it made so much difference with him and for him, and it taught me a lot. Change is constant. Check your conclusions by attaining multiple views. You can look at it from one perspective, change your perspective, and it'll look completely different. So keep this shut and walk around the horse many times. Watch him move. The way they walk is not necessarily the way they're going to gallop, meaning if they're base narrow just standing there, doesn't mean that they're galloping base narrow. They could be very base wide. It's all going to change, but that foot is going to tell you a lot about what's going on. Accumulate all that information to help you help the horse. Because by gosh, you can help the horse. You can make an awful difference. You can make a difference today. You can make a difference in how that horse will compete, what that horse does, how long that horse goes, and the, maybe the, uh, the, the processes that go on within the body, the physiological changes. When you're looking at them, extend the limbs in the natural range of motion. Not out to the side where you're most comfortable, but where the horse is most comfortable. Look down those limbs when you're putting them on your beautiful new green stand. Look down them and see what's going on. Analyze what's going on. Look at the deviations within that limb, because every deviation is going to have an effect on how that horse goes, how long that horse lasts, and what it's capable of doing. And also, what you're going to do with the foot. View the limb from directly above. Look down, look for the bends, look for the angles. Look in those, uh, those limbs, see what's going on. Flex the limbs, flex the limbs. 
That's part of cognitive learning, right? As a cognitive learning, you're picking up a horse's foot. You're feeling things that you don't know you're feeling. You're feeling whether there's mobility in that joint or there's a lack of mobility. You're feeling the resistance in that horse. You're looking at the eyes. You're looking at the ears if they're pinning back and you're picking up that limb or stretching it out. That horse is communicating to you all the time. You need to listen to what that horse is saying because it's going to make a difference in what you do to the bottom of that foot. Watch and feel the horse for a reaction. You get done doing what you're doing to the bottom of the foot, applying a shoe or a boot or whatever you do, and that horse is looking and chewing, that's a good sign. That horse is telling you, this is cool, everything's going all right. Look for that, listen for it. That horse is gonna tell you whether you went wrong or you went right, and they'll tell you immediately. And it's your, your responsibility to listen to them and change it if it's not quite right. Change it, there's something not quite right. Get some more information. Evaluate the hoof conformation. Perform and function. That's all deformable. That hoof wall can move, it can push up, it can push to the side, it can flare, it can underrun. All of those things are telling you something about the conformation up above. All of those are related to the stresses. If your hairline's pushed up, you have a vertical stress, straight up and down. If it's pushed off to the side, you have a diagonal stress or a horizontal stress. Change those stresses. You can change them easily. It doesn't take much to change them either. The faster a horse is going, the less you have to do. I have draft horses. I could put a boat anchor on some of them and it wouldn't change them. But if you have a horse going fast, like a thoroughbred or, or a barrel horse, a couple of millimeters will make a huge difference in that horse. A couple of millimeters more and you might cause catastrophic injury. So we have different deviations within the limbs. We talk about rotational deviations. Rotational, that's a twist. And we commonly refer to it as toed in or toed out. And that's a simplified form. That's what's in our textbooks. But they can actually have several rotational deviations within the same limb. One can go up, one can go in, and uh, what are those rotational deviations going to change within the limb? They're going to change how the breakover is, whether they're off the center of the toe or off to the side. They're also going to change how much that uh, twisting occurs. We know through research that the average hook twists about seven degrees at breakover point. Change where that breakover point is. And if we don't get that breakover appropriate, we're putting it on a rock toe, roll toe something like that. We need to get in the appropriate position or we're creating a leverage point at the point of breakover. Rotational deviations. Axial, that's towed in. Abaxial, that's towed out. The deviations are multiple and vary in every limb. This is nothing new. These have been going on for centuries. Right? Horses have been looked at from the time of Xenophon. And if we look at these pictures, there's some very basic conformational deviations that just use your textbooks. So this is a hinge joint. The condyle, the ridge down the middle. If there's a rotational deviation within a hinge joint, that's going to create more twisting. Important information. You'll see a lot of your horses that have an abaxial rotation at the stifle. That means they're twisting out. We breed them that way. Because as they're propelling themselves, they're pushing forward, the hocks come out. And the longer we can keep those hocks underneath the body, the more energy they put out, and they can push harder, pull harder, whatever they're doing. They could also have a secondary axial rotation down low in an inch joint, like in the fetlock. And so there's a lot of twisting that goes on. And you've seen those horses. It may be in one hind limb and not another, right? They twist real hard as they're pulling off. Some of our old textbooks, they put a bigger caulk on and hold them to the ground. Well, what's going to happen when you put a traction device on that horse and hold it to the ground? You're putting more stress on the collateral ligaments of every joint, the ligaments on both sides of the joint. So those horses with the abaxial rotation of the stifle, axial rotation of the fetlock, we pin them to the ground, we're going to create first damage to the stifle and secondary damage to the fetlock over time. Use the direction of the frog to help evaluate lower rotational deviations. So the rotation of the frog, when we go for our certification or examinations, our, our shoes, because it's a basic standard, have to be directly in line with the frog. But the horses 
Well, that's a great for a horse built in a textbook. And it's great for a basic standard to learn how to do something appropriately. But it's not great for the horses you work on out in the field. Because one limb can have greater rotational deviations than the other one. They're not going to be the same. They're never the same. And unless we're evaluating every limb for those rotational deviations, we're going to do at least one limb a disservice. <coughs> so evaluate that. Watch which way their frog is pointing. For instance, if they have a rotational deviation within the fetlock, in that hinge joint, when you pick them up underneath the horse, it may look like they're really toted, and that frog's pointing towards the midline. You take them out forward, and all of a sudden they look like they're pointing out, because that condyle is on an angle. There's a twist somewhere in there. So it's very different, but when they're standing square and straight up, they may be breaking over appropriately in the center. But there's a lot of twist in that joint as they're going off. It's all important information. Toe out, ab axial rotation. Toe in, axial rotation. And they can be compound in the limbs. Watch down those limbs. Look at which way the knee is going. Look which way the hocks are going. Watch down through that limb. Look at the knees. And when you're evaluating a rotational deviation, get in line with the rotational deviation. And sometimes that's hard because they're compound. So in this limb, the knees are pointing out, and that foot at some point during the phase of stride is going to follow that knee. It's going to go out there at some point, but then come back in. And look at which way the foot is pointing. You can tell that there's uh, compound deviations in there. <coughs> Observe from above. Look down the limb, and it helps to evaluate that. It gives you another perspective where the rotational deviation starts and ends, very important. Is it in a long bone? Is it in a joint? Is it in a condylar joint? Is it in a hinge joint? A condylar joint, that's like your coffin joint. That allows that foot to go in any direction to compensate for uneven terrains, things like that. The fetlock, it doesn't do that so much. It's more straight forward and back. Very important information. Rotational deviations within a hinge joint. So here's a draft horse, and they were bred for centuries to pull a plow, walk in a furrow. A furrow, a 12-inch wide furrow. So you have this great big massive body. You needed those hooves to be close together so they wouldn't step on the potatoes. So we have an abaxial rotation at the stifle. We come down to the tarsus or the hock, and then we want those cannon bones or metatarsals parallel so that they can walk very close without interfering and walk in that furrow to pull the plow or the harrow or whatever you're doing, cultivator. And that's great for that, uh, that job. But if they're bow-legged, bow-legged, so that's a different angular deviation. Hello. I fixed it. So, another angular deviation within the limb. So, so we talked about rotational, we'll get into angular. Angular. The race is starting. Word race from what? So conformational deviations affect hoof shape. And this is out of a textbook from the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's a Swiss manual on Ferrari, and it is one of the most comprehensive textbooks on conformational deviations because it explains the variety of deviations that you can have in one limb. It doesn't isolate them to just uh, one certain conformation in each limb. And it also defines some of the hoof conformational deviations that you see. Hoof conformation. Because that hoof can twist, it can turn, it can be pushed up on one corner or another, it can collapse, and all of those deviations are telling you something. And it may be telling you something about flexural deviations, flexural deviations. Flexural deviations could be over at the knee, back at the knee, sickle hop. All those are flexural deviations. It could be broken back hoof pastern axis, broken forward hoof pastern axis. Those are also flexural deviations. We don't realize how much that we can change the posture with just a few millimeters one direction or another of the horse. The posture, where those hooves are, how they land, how they take off from the ground. 
changing the posture, changes the stresses throughout the limb. It's important. So changing the posture, we can take a lot of stresses off. And when you think about the different stresses that they have on, you look at this one with a broken forward hoof pastern axis. So look at the back of the hoof and up through there, you have a lot of pinching or collapsing of the joint spaces. You have elongation of soft tissue down the front of it. Important, how are you gonna reduce those stresses to that limb? With an angular deviation, which is a bend, how can you reduce the compression of the joints on one side? How can you reduce the elongation of the soft tissues on the other? And if you think about it in those forms, it really helps you define what you might do to a shoe. So when we look at this horse, flexor laxity, you have compression on the front of the joints, in the front of the line. Compression of the joint spaces. You have elongation of the soft tissues. So basically, what do we want to do? First, we want to trim that. Secondly, we want to extend some heels to change the dynamics of that foot, change the posture of that limb to help that animal to stand more appropriately. Broken back hoof pastern axis. You see that all the time. And especially in those horses, those uh, little straight pasterns that you have on some of the western horses, and then the broken back appearance that happens especially over time with work, trying to get that hoof pastern axis in a more appropriate manner is, uh, is going to take a lot of those stressors. Compression and elongation. Back at the knee, pop knee. So that horse came into the clinic and it was a standard bred racehorse and the trainer had said to the veterinarian, my horse isn't performing that well. I think he's got a problem with his breathing. And I had to change all the shoes on the horses because they, the treadmill belt was very expensive. We had to get rid of the traction devices, smooth it up so it didn't uh, hurt the belt or the horse. And I'm looking at that animal and I said, Doc, look at that knee. I think the wind resistance alone would slow that horse. <laughs> and he says, you're right, Mike. There, there may be an issue there, but we have to uh, think about what the trainer said and, and, and look at that. So they run him on the treadmill and by gosh, he did have a breathing problem. So I'm, I'm chewing on my shoe at that point, and then just to stop me from whining and crying, they did a lameness examination, and that horse didn't have any lameness with that puff knee. Well, that tells you something. One is it's a standard breath, right? Those that walk in horses are the toughest horses on the planet, I think. You could have cut that leg off, thrown it ahead, that horse would have ran and caught it. You show this picture to a thoroughbred, it would have been belly up. <laughs> it's just like barriers as we mature, you know, your significant others that say, you're having a hard time getting out of bed, right? you're not looking so good, you need to go get some x-rays. And you go in to get some x-rays and the technician is in his booth saying, wow, cool. That's exciting. I've never seen anything like that. I don't want to hear that stuff. But you're still getting up and chewing horses. In fact, after today, sitting around all day, you'll be pretty sore. You've got to get back underneath the horse to feel good. Your pathology, so your tendons, ligaments, and everything change according to what you do every day, all day long. And it becomes a posture that's more comfortable than doing anything else, as it is with our horses over at the knees, so they're bouncing at the knees. You often see, the, especially the thoroughbred boot mares that have been all busted up from racing and training, they're just bouncing around out in the pasture like this. It's usually an acquired deviation. You'll often see it in foals when they're lax and newborn. But which one is worse, over at the knees or back at the knees? Back at the knees, right? Because there's a lot of compression on the front of the knee. My draft horses are all back at the knee, but that's cool because they're bred to work in a certain discipline, right? That's pulling a plow or some tool over soft ground at three to four mile an hour for long periods of time. In fact, to plow an acre of land, which is what the average farmer could plow in a day, that farmer, that horse, had to walk 18 miles to plow one acre of land. That's why they're all skinny back then, right? 18 miles a day pulling that plow around. So at that speed, that works good, but you have a client that has this big fuzzy Clydesdale that's really pretty, has a nice face, and says, I want to jump this horse. <laughs> this is not going to work, is it? Because that horse is back at the knee. You're going to break that horse in a, a rapid amount of time. 
sickle ox. If you're into reining horse, you like this. This horse will get it down and slide. Right? This horse can get it on. But it's going to have issues, right? You're compressing the front of that hock joint. You're elongating the soft tissues on the back part of the joint. <coughs> right? Very important. So by changing this, changing this, we can change it some. When you put your sliding plate on there, you may back it up a little bit on the foot. You may extend it off the heels. You're going to change the posture. You're going to move that limb slightly back, which is important for that horse, isn't it? Because you get too much, and you're going to create more stress. This and too much could be just another inch and posture change. Right? But your shoes can change almost immediately. Your trim and your shoes are going to change very quickly. So what happens with this horse? We have these guidelines or rules that says if you have a soft tissue in injury, you need to increase with the web underneath that soft tissue injury. Right? That's a guideline. But what happens when you put a bar shoe or a wedge pad on a horse like this? You all of a sudden push them further forward. You you compounded the stresses on them, so knowing the conformation will help you define what you do to help that horse out. What works for this horse is going to be very different than what you do for this horse, who is very straight through the stifles, they're straight through the hocks, and you go down, and it's still slightly sickle hock because the bottom of the cannon bone is slightly forward of what the top is, so it's still slightly sickle hock. It's also broken back even after trimming. So this one, you could put a wedge on there, you could put a bar shoe on there, which would be very good for the soft tissue injuries that this animal gets. Very different depending on the conformation. Look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. Einstein, take the time to step back and look at these animals. They'll tell you a lot about what's going on in their stain. Valgus deviation. If that metacarpal goes in, it's a varus deviation. Is that important for a hook care provider to know those terms? I, don't know. I, got a I like all the head nods. You know, when a veterinary student goes to school, they don't get too much on the foot. And when I started at Cornell in 91, the average veterinary student had about four hours on the foot. That included anatomy, physiology, diseases, trimming, shoes. Four hours. What I learned in the first four hours, I worked on a hook. <laughs> trying to learn how to breathe. <laughs> I didn't even look at the hook. <laughs> Stop bleeding from the sharp grass. There's other things to think about. And, and our terminologies are different, right? As a farrier, we have certain terminologies. Anytime you take on a new occupation, you take on a new hobby, you have to learn at least 1,800 new words. So the veterinary student has all these big words that you don't understand. You have all these big words, plus some superlatives that you use once in a while that the veterinarian doesn't understand. It's important to help communicate back and forth by learning some of the terminologies that we all use. So varus and valgus will help you out in defining the conformational deviations because it helps you in your communication with the owner and the veterinarian when defining a certain product that you're going to use on the horse. So how does this complicate itself? So if you look down through that limb, and you look at it, you want to know where you're going to widen the hook, widen the shoe, or narrow the shoe, right? It's going to help you with an angular deviation. It's going to help the horse with an angular deviation. But they all have compound deviations, so you don't want to put too much on it. You're going to hurt the one up above it. And also, it helps you define how you're going to hold that horse. A horse that is tarsal valgus goes out in the tarsus. Uh, you take that leg and you pull it way out there so you're comfortable and you saddle it over your, your hip. That horse is going to suck you under because you have just compressed the outside of that joint that's already hurting more. So knowing those will be important. It will be important for your welfare. Lower limb, angular deviations. And these are the ones that are tricky because it's easier to see them in the stifle, the hock, or the knee. But you get down to the fetlock and the pastor and the coffin joint. Those are very important. Those are going to make a great difference on how, on how that buff deforms and how it's capable of accepting the stresses that are applied upon it. And when you go down through those limbs, you can see some of Schweider's lines. And you look down through there, so the horse is going out or in at the fetlock. And it varies, it can vary from one limb to another. Then down through the pasture and watch that, down through the foot, watch that. 
And you may be able to see it better when you extend that limb. Look down through there and look at that. And think about what that happens because it's going to have a very different effect on the hoof capsule according to what's going on. So look at the hoof capsule deformation. I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, mean to have that horse bearing all the weight on that crooked foot, but that horse goes down through the fetlock. It's varies, right, from the fetlock? It goes in. But then at the pastern in the coffin joint, it goes out. And the hoof is blaring to the outside. That tells you that the lower valgus is greater than the upper varus. There's some of your terminology. So that means it goes out lower more than it goes in upper. So it's going to flare to the outside. So this one, knock the mud off of there so you can see it. It is muddy season in the northeast. Knock the mud off of there. So at the knee, it goes out. At the fetlock, it goes in. And then you can see a twist. An axial rotation. Then at the coffin joint, it comes slightly out again. Think about the compression on the inside of that fetlock. The compression on the outside of the knee. And how are we going to regulate this? So look at the hoof conformation. Is the hoof going towards the inside, meaning is it flaring towards the inside toe corner, or is it flaring towards the outside toe corner? It's telling you what most of the stresses are to that limb. So if you're going to increase with the web to help this horse out, because it's going in more than it's going out, you're going to increase with the web on the outside or lateral, the outside of that shoot. But if you increase it too much, you're going to pinch the knee more, aren't you? You're going to pinch the knee more. If you put a great big aluminum shoe with two inches of extension out there, you're going to pinch that knee more. So what happens to this horse the first time it goes into training or soon after? It's going to have some, something going on with the cut lock. The veterinarians are going to get that taken care of. It's going to go out there maybe the first race day or something, and then the knee is going to go. And then what happens? It goes to the breeding farm. They make more of them. It's job secure. <laughs> This is bow-legged, bow-legged meaning there's more varus, it goes in more than it goes out. So all of your compression is on the inside of those joints. Bow-legged. This is a tarsal valgus, so at the hock it's going out. What, what kind of terms do you use for that? Do you have terms for that? Cow hock, right? So other terminology. So those are easy, but these get more difficult. If you follow down through this limb, the, the left arm, the hoof shape is going to tell you things, but the deviations occur outside of joints also. Look at the hawk, it's pointing out. Follow your eye down through the cannon bone. Look what happens, there's a bow right in that cannon bone. Are you going to fix that with shoes or screws? or No, no, that's the way that animal is. But then look down through the hoof wall. Look at the hoof. That's your job, right? Look at the hook. Is there deformation to that? No, that hairline is smooth. Look at that. That's textbook hook. That hook is telling you it ain't broke. Don't fix it. Right? Everything's cool here. Go away. And that's important information for you because you start mucking with this, you're going to mess something else up. Right? For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Look at this one right from the knee. Go down. Look at the bow in that cannon bone. This one had braces on it, had casts on it, had shoes on. You can see the cast sores on the front of the fetlock and the coffin joint. You're not going to change that. That's the way that animal is. All that was created was more damage to this animal by trying to do something. And some of them are beyond our circle of influence, right? You have to know when it's too much. When I got out of farrier school, I pat myself on the back saying, I can fix everything, I can chew anything. No, no, I've been out of 44 years now. I think I'm getting pretty retarded because I have more questions, right? What's, what's going on here? Be aware of pathology and injuries. This is a surgically fused pastern. This is what you as a hoof care provider know as soon as you pick that up. It feels like a tree stump to me. What are you going to do for that one? That doesn't have articulation in the joint, so you want to put it in the shoe. You want to help that horse out by putting it in the bottom of the foot, because that's not going to change. A disparity in the bulbs of the heels, uneven stresses, right? If one bulb is bigger than the other one, there's an uneven stresses. 
start looking at that, you'll notice quite a disparity in those bulbs of the heels. And the left hind might be different than the right hind, and vice versa with the front feet. Look at the bulbs of the heels. They're going to tell you about the disparity in the back of that foot, because a horse with a rotational deviation is going to have dispar disparity in the stresses to that foot as it lands, right? It might be outside, it might be inside depending on if it's base narrow or base wide. This gets complicated, doesn't it? And every limb is different. That's why rules don't work. This is why you become so exceptional with your cognitive learning over time. Because you are able to feel those things and see those things, even though you may not be able to describe them. You know that just because a textbook says, for this injury, this is what you do, that's not always what you do. There's art to it. You've got to be planning ahead, looking at everything down through there. Not only that, how does the fetlock fall through the back of the foot? Right? Where is the fetlock falling through? It's falling off to one side, isn't it? We want it to fall through the middle. Why? Because then the stresses are more equal through the joints of that animal. The stresses or the compression to the joints is equalized. The stresses to the soft tissues is equalized. We're not going to be able to achieve it on all of them. And we want to do it conservatively, and we want to do it often. And what's often? We know through modern research that if we go over four weeks with the shoeing period, we lose a couple of degrees with every week. A couple of degrees. So if you're going six weeks, you've lost at least four degrees. Eight weeks. You're never going to catch up. You'd be amazed at what you can do with the feet if you move your shooting period down to four weeks. I know that's hard. <laughs> I said this in Montana last week. <laughs> and I had ranchers there, well, we want a third to come in here in June, put them on so we can get the cows to the mountains, and a good barrier can keep them on through hunting season in October. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? There's something about that too because then they let the shoes fall off and the animal goes out onto the, the pasture and it heals for the next six months or whatever it takes to get back to June, right? They have a break. But those horses that you're working on that are highly competitive and working and going all the time and always shot and don't get enough exercise, four weeks is it. It's amazing how you can help those horses out by shoe, shortening your shooting period. Interference issues, they can cre be created by uh, conformational deviations in R. They can also be created by pathologies, right? Pathology is some injury from the past. So looking for old wire cuts and feeling the bumps and lumps and looking at those uh, gnarly hocks, things like that is very important to help you define what's going on. A proximal shunt of the heel due to vertical stresses. You see that all the time, don't you? One heel will be pushed up to the sky. So I have an issue with the T-square because that's great for a horse that grew up in a textbook, but I never worked on one of those. All of these horses have different conformational deviations, and this horse is a pretty heavy horse. It has an axial rotation. That means it toes in. It's base narrow meaning the foot is traveling close to the midline. It lands laterally, lands on the outside corner because of its rotation. When it loads, all of the vertical stresses are medial on the inside. That hoof is telling you that you're having a lot of vertical stresses on the inside. Well, shouldn't we try to change that or help that? We're not going to fix the horse. We're not going to change its conformation. But we can reduce the vertical stress, one, by trimming down that medial wall and then extending or increasing the width of web laterally to slightly move that horse apart. Maybe turn the shoe so that it's in line with the line of motion, the way that horse is going, so that the heels are landing more equally. Reduce the vertical stress by decreasing the width of web on the inside so it sinks slightly in a deformable surface. And people say, well, that only works on a deformable surface. No, we can change the posture right on this concrete by changing the dimensions of your shoe from one side to another. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist with a forge to do that. They have great grinders in here that'll just take that and your knuckles down in a nanosecond. <laughs> Diagonal and horizontal stresses. A horse with rotational deviations, twists within the limb, will get a flare to one corner or another. It might be a heel and an opposite toe, right? Those, that, that tells you that there's rotational deviations within the limb, and it's one, 
maybe several rotational deviations, but it's either going to be axial or abaxial. That's going to tell you a lot about those rotational deviations. And it's also going to tell you that you're going to have to modify your brake over. This hook could use a more regular trimming pattern. Would make a big difference. Uh, Mike? Yes. What do you think that in the previous picture, when you see color like that, I'm trying to, to, to understand where the, where the flare is, it's, what is causing it. Is it moved opposite of where the stress has been placed? Great crest question. So look at the rings in the hook wall. You see the rings? Uh -huh. So on the flare side, are they wider apart or closer together? They're compressed. So that's telling you, your hoof wall will tell you a lot by those rings. Do you have compression? That'll make those rings tighter. Compression is caused by uh, a decrease in growth of vertical stresses. Does that make any difference? Say that again. So, you know, it's just like wood. You can have compressed grain where the grain is close together on one side of a tree or another, depending on how the wind is blowing it. You can have twisted grain and, and uh, horizontally shunted grain. And the, the hoof wall can have that too. So we know that all cells need a certain amount of stress. Too much stress, and we destroy them. Too little stress, and they atrophy. They don't get enough circulation. So when you look at the, the compression of those, those rings, that's either too much stress or too little stress. And when I look at the lower part of that foot, I'm thinking, that's too much stress. There's compression there. At some point in that stride, that animal's compression in that wall. So this is generally, if it's just in a toe quarter like that, it's because they have a rotational deviation. And this one might be towed out. So it's getting uneven stresses, like they're more horizontal when you get a flare like that. So this may be an animal that goes in the fetlock and out strong out at the coffin joint. So it's going to have vertical stresses on the inside wall, that heel will be shunted up, and it'll flare to the outside corner. So if we look at that, think about where it's pinching. It's pinching on the outside of the joint. If we change that by slightly increasing the width of web on the inside of that foot, right, the non-flared side, we're changing the posture slightly. It will change the dynamics of how that foot goes. And it's really neat. If you look at the hairline, you'll notice a difference in those rings within four weeks. You'll see the difference. And you look for the difference to see if they're still compressed, to see if you've gone in the right direction. Make sense? So when I first started looking at this, I always wanted a rule, right? OK, a horse that flares out has this, this, and this conformational deviations. It just isn't so, because there's so many variables. Right? and so many differences in how much the deviations are, how much the twist is. So looking at each one is so important. You might note the wear of the shoe, right? How is the shoe wearing? And there's another topic I'm going to bring up, and this is for them. I don't reset shoes. The shoe wears. Well, as a farrier, you know that. You know, back in the beginning when I first started out and was hoping that the first client would pay me cash so I could buy gas to get to the second one, I didn't pay attention to my own shoes. And because of what I do, the discipline, I always got a foot there, so I'm wearing the outside heels. Look at your own heels, and you'll wear one heel more than another one. And after a while, you're getting more compression on the inside of your joints here. You're getting elongation of the soft tissues on the outside. All of a sudden, your stride is getting closer. You're walking, you're rope walking, right? And you start get back aches and, and neck aches and knees hurt, everything hurts. If you take a shoe that's already wearing and reset that, you are enhancing the deviations, not helping with the deviations. I'm not trying to sell shoes here, I'm just trying to tell you, you'll have greater effect if you evaluate the horse every time, you make the appropriate changes, you do those appropriate changes, you look for validation by what the horse tells you, and then you move on. Plus, you get better at your techniques of changing the shoes. But most importantly, it gives us to look at the horses. And it has to be done on a four-week period. A horse's gait will make a lot of difference. You've worked on those horses with an upright foot and a flat foot. There's a difference in the gait of those two limbs. And it's usually the right foot, right? It's more upright. That horse, the stride duration is the same. 
the time in which it spins in one part of the stride is very different. That upright foot is not extending as much. It's spending more time in flexion. The other foot is crushing the heels down, very flat, toes running out. It's spending more time in extension and less time in flexion. And it could be because of the way they were in the uterus, it could be their grazing stance, it could be an injury, it could be a, a bloodline, all kinds of things that will create that. My draft horses, because they work at a walk, will just wear the toe because they put enough energy into it to pull that load and then they're not extending. They're walking very short striding. A thoroughbred racehorse, or one that's going fast, will crash, crush the heels and then the toe because they're extending such a great amount. It tells you a lot about what's going on. Look at uneven heel wear. That'll tell you. This horse has a rotational deviation, right? One heel is further back than the other. There's got to be a twist in that limb somewhere. Look down through that limb. Okay, underneath the inside. Okay, that rock's going to slow down your knife a little bit and probably dull it up. Look at the outside toe corner. You'll see one part's broken off. So probably the horse is breaking over at that point, right? The side of the hook, not the center of the toe. The horse has a fungal infection. Look at the frog. It's got the little fuzzies on it. It's got a fungal infection. It's eating away all the insensitive tissue, more often seen in a tropical environment like West Palm, or a wet spring in New England. Look at the, the conformation of the foot. Research shows us that he has slightly more hook between the, from the center of the frog to the outside wall, outside of the outside wall. They have less lameness issues than those that have more foot from the center of the frog to the inside. Make sense? So if they're flaring to the inside, they're probably going to be crippled faster than ones that are flaring to the outside. That's what that says. And so when you're trimming, we're trying to even that up. But look at the plane of the frog. The plane of the frog from front to back and from side to side will tell you a lot about what's going on with the bottom of the foot and how you can help that horse out. Frog is soft tissue. It's going to deviate according to the stresses applied upon it, which are the same as how the soul is going to deviate. The soul plane is going to deviate, the wall is going to deviate. So you're looking at all these factors that will help you define what you need to do with the shoe or whatever appliance you're putting on the bottom of the foot. Get out your ruler and measure that. You want slightly more distance to the outside. That would be appropriate. And if you can't do with the trim, then you modify your shoe to have slightly greater width on the outside. Make sure that you're not fitting to that medial toe flare or that inside toe flare. Make sure you're tightening up that quarter and giving the horse slightly more laterally. Just a few millimeters will change how that foot is. And it's amazing how you can change the shape of that foot. How those changes in energy and forces will change how that's going. It's no different than the modern technology we have for us. You know, you step on a force plate, it'll tell you where the most force is on your limb. And if you ever looked at yourself in the mirror, you'd figure out why you have those forces. And it's the same with the horses. The horse might be windswept. You've seen those bowls, right, where they're sweeping. You're not going to put the same type of shoe on this foot as you are on that one. Okay, we might use the same uh, DF hind shoe, or select hind shoe. But on this one, we need medial width. On this one, we need lateral width. You're not going to put a DF Grand Prix on both of them with lateral width because you're going to do one of them a disservice, right? It's going to be this one. You're going to create more so. Look at the frog plane. Measure the frog plane. There's all kinds of research that says they should have at least 50% before and after that. If we take off too much of the foot in the front, which is a current trend now, we bar our cool factor made shoes to the side clips and we heat them up and we pull them back till those side clips hit and then maybe shape a little bit behind there. So we're taking off all the toes. <coughs> well that limb is is meant to use all the soft tissues and the joints in, in moderation. So if we take off the toes, we're putting more stress on the superficial flexor tendon and the suspensory ligament. And then, then if we leave that shoe hanging out the back door, we're putting more stress on the superficial flexor tendon and the suspensory ligament, but we're taking it off the deep digital flexor tendon. Well, we need that deep digital flexor tendon to be incorporated because as that hoof and that limb is fully weight-bearing, the deep digital flexor tendon 
the implant ligament, the navicular suspensory ligament, they all get energy pushed into it, they're stretched. And that helps the foot go off the ground again. And without that, we're putting even more stress on the suspensory and the superficial flexor tendon. So we have to equalize this. If you're backing up the shoe too much, you're putting too much stress on certain soft tissues and taking it off others, and there's going to be there's going to be an issue. Hook care four weeks, but if you're doing minis, it might be every two weeks, right? They grow like crazy and they don't wear off their feet. So depending on the horse, it, it might be even more regular deviations in hook growth. Have you ever seen that where you can put your thumbs in the heels like that? I was working on a, a horse in the shop and Doug Butler walked by, he was visiting his family there and he, he stops and he says, Mike, that, that horse probably has navicular problems. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> so after he left, <laughs> I run the horse over to radiology and my oh, gosh, that horse had navicular problems. <laughs> so uh, when we put the appropriate shoes on, shorten up the shoeing period and the hoof wall came around, the navicular problems never came around, but the hoof wall came around. But it was interesting, the deviations will tell you a lot about the forces and how that horse is using its limb. No, my, uh recognizing that navicular problem from that there, I mean, what's just just limited growth back there, or what is the horse going on? The horse is just using its foot differently because of uh, the, the, the inability to extend so much. And uh, Dr. Tracy Turner did a lot of studies where he, he uh, radiographed navicular bones on every horse that came through the front of the clinic, whether they were colic or whatever was going on. You know, so he radiographed them all and found out that, gee, a lot of horses have navicular changes that didn't exhibit any navicular problems, right? So it doesn't mean that that's what they have. Right. Additional information is always a good idea. Get a picture, get a radiograph. Right? You have a client that buys a horse, suggest that they get some radiographs, right? That's a, that's a good thing to do. Why? Because it helps you out too. You know, a few years later, at some point they're going to go lame, aren't they? They all have a shelf life, just like we do. And you want to see what was affecting them when you got them, so you have some basis to go off. And you have a horse like this that is uh, is falling down in the back part of the foot, and it has a an extended uh, palmar process. This is the palmar process. There's also some issues up in the front of the joint. So we may have a few different conditions to work on there. The hoof wall flexes and deforms according to stresses. Think about these stresses. Look at that hairline. How is it tipped one way or another? Is it tipped diagonally or is it tipped uniformly? All of those will help you to define what's going on. Look at the cracks. Look at the cracks in the sole. When you're manicuring that sole, and you're manicuring them too much, we need to leave just a little bit more. Mother Nature put that there for a reason. It wasn't for us to take our new sharp knives and take it all off until we can check the pulse with our thumb. <laughs> but look at those cracks. Those cracks will tell you a lot. Look at the cracks as the, fold, the sole is exfoliating. If they're all on one side or in line with the center line, they'll tell you where the most stresses are in that hook. If they're all uniform around there, you get a soft foot that's just the frogs falling down through with every time. Those cracks will define a lot about what's going on with that limb above there and the stress is going into it. Start studying those. Look at them. Walk your horse. Walk your horse. Watch it walk. I know we get to barns and they're all in cross ties waiting for us. We have apprentices taking shoes up. We never looked at those horses walk. It's a good idea to see if they're lame before you start. Right? If they're head bobbing kind of out the stall. Because if they're lame after you're done, it's your fault. Look and see if they're lame before you start. That few minutes will help you out. This is a, a covered bridge over the Connecticut River which separates Vermont from New Hampshire. And I love this sign, walk your horse or two dollar fine. So think about that every time you work you're on a horse. Walk your horse or two dollar fine. I'll tell you what, that fine might be a lot more than two dollars if it's white. <coughs> Look at the hoof prints. 
It might be just in the rubber mat. You can see if that hoof is twisting. You can see the direction of that foot fall, those tracks uh, when they walk across the mat. Better yet, take them out into the ring and watch the depressions in most of these deformable surfaces. You can actually measure which side of the hoof is going in further than the other. You can measure it, especially if it's in Europelt. Watch for the twist. Watch the differences in that animal. Look at that left hind foot. You see how that heel is curled under? It's curled under. <coughs> you don't have to agree with me. You know that the average male lies four times a day, and this could be one of those times. <laughs> so watch how that foot goes. The outside heel is curled under. It's starting to flare to the medial toe quarter. That's telling you that this limb is traveling closer to the midline. Right? Or even beyond the midline. Look at the right hind. It's flaring laterally. That quarter bend is way back where it ought to be. That one has a compound deviation where it's got a coffin joint valve as it goes out. Right? So that's flaring to the outside. That right hind also has a twist as it's going off. So it's telling me a lot. On the right hind, if I'm going to increase with the web, it has to be on the inside or the medial side. On the left hind, if I'm going to increase with the web, it has to be on the lateral side, and I have to soften it or set it down. That hoof is, is going to get side bone at some point, an ossification of the lateral cartilage. So I'm going to soften it, I'm going to put a side bone shoe on it before it gets there, and if I extend anything out the outside of that left hind, I'm going to create more stresses to that quarter. I'm going to crush it even more. Adding shoe outside is leverage every millimeter. The horse is twisting on the right hand, you can see it, quite a twist, so I have to take traction off of that. And I'll go to a sliding plate on some of these horses or something like it, a stamped shoe to help that horse out, to allow it to slide, and that's going to depend on the surface that horse works on. Hear the sound of the hoof beats. Listen to that horse as it's walking down the breezeway. Listen to it. You'll hear a lot about it. One time early on, I was with a standard bred horse shoe, and he said, let's go down to the track this morning and watch the horses go. So we go down to the track and it's all foggy and, and, and uh, it's five o'clock in the morning and I'm there <coughs> waiting to watch the horses going around. He turns around and leans against the rail. I say, what the heck are you doing? You wait. And they come around the rail, he's listening. He can tell more about the way the horse is going by listening to it than watching it because we can't actually see what's going on because it's going so fast. But you've got cool cameras now, you can slow down those to frame by frame to see a lot more than we could in days gone by. Listen to the horses. Note the environment the horse is, is in. You know, where does it live? How does it live? Does it spend 25 hours a day in the stall, or does it get to go out? That's all going to make a difference. The management of the horse. It takes a team. They say it takes a whole community to raise a child. Well, it takes a team to keep a horse going. It takes a lot of people who get face-to-face, -face, the old-fashioned way, not a note on the stall door, to talk about what's going on with this horse and what we can do to help him out. Communicate expectations. So, you want to go to the Olympics. <laughs> Shire horse, jump fences, six feet high. Well, I don't have the same expectations for your horse. We may not be able to work this out. Know the expectations. Communicate the expectations. I will do the best I can on every horse. I will do the best job that I can that day. But I may not be able to turn Fluffy into an Olympic horse. Understand the differences in hook care depending on arena surfaces. You're working on Europelt, that's very sticky surface. You might go to classic rollers, a half round shoe on all of those. Any traction at all, they'll be crippled in a couple of days. Know the environment. There's no one shoe that's great for every environment. Right? There's going to be limitations and that has to be communicated to those that want to ride. Environmental considerations in the Northeast, it changes dramatically from one season to the next. It's very different, the type of shoes, or the traction that you're going to put on, and knowing what you have to put on and trying to talk Mother Nature into agreeing with you is very important. It's, it, uh, it gets complicated. Rider ability. I know that some of you people are fantastic riders. You can get a horse to do things that that horse didn't know it could do. Me, I'm a passenger. That's why I ride draft horses. I can bounce a few times before I hit my head. But if we weight down a horse that is a, a high-level horse, we're going to cause problems. You've got to keep it simple. 
Keep it simple. Without challenge, there is no advancement. Challenge yourself every day. Challenge yourself to look at the horses a little closer. Challenge yourself to form a routine to go over those horses. Challenge yourself to use words so that you can communicate with everybody on that team so that you can do the best for that horse. Challenge yourself every day. And set the stride to keep the pace for greater understanding. Keep continuing education going. Listen to lots of people, even if you take a couple of plugs home today. You've advanced. you challenged yourself. You have uh, gone further in your career. You have a lot of 10,000 hour increments that you have to get through. And above all, respect the horse. Your life may depend on it. Right? That's your livelihood. I know I've made my livelihood off of horses since I was a kid. <clears throat> I sent my kids through college. I have supported the family. I have bought houses with it. I, I depend on those horses, and I want to show them some respect. And if I can't show them some respect, then I might not be able to work for that individual or, or that horse. Listen to the horses. They'll tell you what's going on. Build a team to improve results. Work with people that you can communicate with, because there's going to be people that will frustrate the heck out of you and you can't work with. It may be time to do what Nancy Reagan said and just say no. <laughs> Tap into the cognitive learning of others. There's a lot of very intelligent people here. Tap into the cognitive learning and the breaks and stuff like that. Uh, sometimes it's a lot better information than you got from the speakers. The only gift is a portion of thyself, and every horse, leave a portion of yourself. Do a better job. Think about where you, you could have made improvements, right? Look at the horse when you get done. Well, there's room for improvement there. I should do this, or I should do that. Put two nails in before slogging them all in so that you can, you can look at that hook and look at that shoe to see if it's appropriate, and go ahead and make the changes that, that aren't. Those nails are about 14 cents a piece now, you know, you're pulling eight of them. <laughs> and look at this shoe, it's a really beautiful shoe, right? It's a beautiful shoe for a horse with a soft tissue lesion underneath the frog support on that side. But this shoe would be catastrophic for a thoroughbred racehorse because it's steel, it's too heavy, it's too much. And it wouldn't be enough for a big warm blood horse. Every shoe has to be thought about. You have to think about all the different factors that are involved to try to help this horse out. Thank you very much. Perhaps these questions will be better one on one. Um, but your pals would like to hear them. They may not be pals after this. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the barbecue or a wedge pad on a sit hawk horse versus a horse that's. You call it camped out. Behind. Right. Yep. So I think you said that with a bar shoe or a wedge pad, it'll help them to stand more underneath. Yeah, if they're a severe sickle hocked horse, it'll push those limbs further underneath. So you're going to further enhance the stresses or elongation of the soft tissues on the back part of the leg. Okay, so help me understand how that happens. It seems to my mind if you have a wedge, it's going to. Cause them to stand, I guess, okay, never mind. So you wedge that up, or you have more flotation in your, your formal surface, it's going to push it back. Right. So sometimes I have to use my own limbs. As a, you know, if, I, if I take my limb forward and put a heel on it, and what's that going to do? It's going to push it forward. And if I have it back here and I put a lift, I'm, I'm pushing my body forward. Does that make any sense? So it's changing the posture. How the hook is deviated or how the limb is deviated is very important because your whatever you put on the bottom may be completely different. I guess I guess first off, is that really a sick lot of force or is that confirmation? Well it is confirmation, isn't it? A sickle hawk is a conformational deviation, but you as a barrier can change a lot of those before you start trimming. It looks like it's way sickle hawk. Okay, right. they have a 16-week shoeing period, so there might be some length of toe or something there. And so you take all that off and you move the shoe back where it belongs underneath the foot, and all of a sudden the horse isn't sickle locked anymore. It's not going to help all of them, but it's going to help a lot of them. Right. Good point. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Mike.